Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at AUW today to talk more about the coronavirus, the impact on the U.S. economy, and what's next in our labor economy. I'm Kim Churches, CEO of AUW. We're going to be joined by uh, Diane Lim, an economist, who's going to be talking with us a great deal about what to expect during this pandemic that has just devastated the U.S. economy, uh, and the health risks are continuing on and on as the numbers march towards 200,000 and people who've passed away, uh, and more than 6 million people diagnosed with the virus in this country alone. So we'll be talking a little bit about what this means in the fight for equity in the workplace and in our society, and what to expect next. And with that, I am going to welcome Diane Lim, who's joined us today. She's an economist, she's a friend, uh, and I know she has so many insights today because she's been working in this space, um, broad-based in a, in a macroeconomic view of our nation, as well as really diving into how it's affecting people of color, women, and those at every level of the socioeconomic status in our country today. She's also the author of the Economist Bomb blog, which I highly encourage you to check out, um, and she's active on Twitter and social media as well. So if you want to follow along with Diane uh, in Twitter after this conversation today or on LinkedIn, um, please see her handles right here on this screen. And Diane, welcome to AUW and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to join us today to talk through these important issues. Oh, thanks, Kim. It's great to be here. Thanks. So, you know, I, I kind of laid it out a little bit that we know the numbers are creeping towards 200,000 who've perished from the virus. Uh, we saw just an unprecedented dive in our economy uh, with those that were furloughed and unemployed in the first couple of months. And then we saw again another rise as states began to reopen at varying rates and the virus took hold in so many parts of our geography as well. Um, we know that the adverse impact for the economy is going to have a tail here as well even if we're able to get to a vaccine that can be widely distributed and start to return to some semblance of normal. But, you know, we know this is um, different than the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And I'm wondering, Diane, if you can just kind of set the scene for us to start a little bit about how COVID-19 and where we are since March in our labor economy is different than what we saw 10, 11 years ago. Yeah, thanks. So um, this is what I refer to as the pandemic recession. It's been labeled by um, Nicole Mason of um, IWPR as the she session. Um, and um, that has been very appropriate of a label for this recession. It's why it's such a different um, economic experience from any business cycle that we've ever experienced before in this country. Um, the great recession was um, a heavily manufacturing driven recession in the sense that um, we had already been experiencing a slow, pretty steady decline of manufacturing jobs because those were the jobs that were most easily automated or offshore to other countries. Uh, so we had already been experiencing a lot of job loss, steady job loss, not related to a recession before. Um, before the financial crisis hit. And then I think what happened in the Great Recession was that a lot of um, auto manufacturing workers, for one, uh, were laid off. Um, their auto manufacturing, heavy manufacturing jobs are disproportionately held by uh, men and actually middle-aged men um, and actually middle-aged white men, to come to think of it. And um, they were uh, they bore a huge cost of the layoffs, and even when the economy started to recover from the Great Recession, um, a lot of those jobs didn't come back because they weren't going to have come back anyway. Even before the recession, they were going away for good um, because of a lot of the automation effect. This um, during the Great Recession, women actually fared pretty well, relatively well. And as the economy recovered and unemployment started to come down and job growth started to pick up, we saw that women were coming back more strongly than men. And we had a very easy explanation for that. And that was that the men tend to work more goods producing jobs. The women tend to work more service providing jobs. 
and the service providing sectors of the economy, like health and education, and even very strongly leisure and hospitality, were just totally booming. You know, like we will always have demand for health and education services. Um, we will always have demand for a need for government workers, right? Um, and we um, were increasingly finding that the American consumer was less interested in buying big ticket things and more interested in spending their money going out to eat and experiencing shows and sports events. And so we saw the leisure hospitality part of what people were buying really going up while the purchases of things were going down. So, you know, during the recovery from the Great Recession, we saw for the first time that the amount of money people spent for food away from home was exceeded the amount they were spending for food that they consumed at home, right? So, um, so we saw a change in what the economy, the composition of the economy and the jobs that were in highest demand. And it turned out to be good for women's employment because those were the jobs that women were already disproportionately occupying. Um, so women did better in the Great Recession. Their increase in unemployment at the worst part of the Great Recession was smaller than um, male unemployment. And um, this time around, it's the flip side. It is um, a recession that is disproportionately affecting service providing occupations. And um, because those are the jobs that are disproportionately held by women, and this time, not just women, but, you know, if you look at the population of workers that um, are in leisure hospitality sector or other human service industries, you can see that they're disproportionately, um, not just female, but disproportionately lower income, lesser educated, young, very young, um, and they're more likely to be working part time than full time. They're more likely to be on hourly pay rather than salary. Um, they're more likely to be people of color. Mm -hmm. So all of those characteristics make this recession concentrated an impact on the segments of our population that were already the most economically vulnerable. And so that's what makes this recession particularly challenging compounded by the fact that the reason why we had to have such a slowdown in that part of our economy was because of the public health problem, that these were um, jobs and economic activities where people gathered, you know, so um, uh, it's especially challenging this time around because it's really difficult to think about bringing back that part of the economy when we don't have the public health crisis under control. And when even if we did have it under control and eventually get it under control, I think people's preferences are forever changed. People's desire to go out and do the things they used to do, they're not going to go back and do them the same way. And so we have to expect that not all of the jobs that have been lost are going to come back because these businesses will be transformed, they will be lower capacity businesses, and that means they need fewer workers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I was in a conversation uh, uh, with, a, with a group um, on Zoom, of course, um, about a week ago on, you know, kind of which industry sectors are either going to be permanently or really drastically changed um, by what we've been going through over the last five to six months. And certainly, you know, I've been a road warrior my whole career, constantly on planes, trains, and automobiles, and I can't anticipate that level of business travel returning anywhere near to whatever normal was back then to what the new normal will be once, once we're able to get past the pandemic. Because we've just seen, you know, there's a lot of it that's just um, not fruitful travel, just fruitless uh, that we can do, you know, through technology and the like. And so as we think about some of those service industries, whether, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, Diane, you know, the, the hotel industry was already just like the taxi industry and like, we're already being um, impacted by the gig economy and what will come now next um, in some of those industries um, that were reliant on an old kind of 20th century business model that just doesn't keep pace with where we are today. Yeah. Um, and we can talk more about that. 
you know, I do think I wanted to touch on the fact, and you know, part of this too as well, um, everything that you've just said uh, from from the economy side point of and the jobs people are in. It's also exactly as you said with public health and that we know that people of color are being impacted by coronavirus more greatly, just actually health wise, not just only economically. So it really is compounding in both ways, particularly because um, so many are essential workers. Um, but for a lot of well documented reasons, people of color are being impacted more health wise as well. So it makes this um, exceedingly difficult for so much of our population. Um, yeah. Yeah, if, if we, we also know, you know, for a brief point in this little moment in December of 2019, where if you and I were looking into a crystal ball, had no idea what this year was going to look like for any of us, but we know just for a brief period there, uh, women surpassed men at a rate of about 50.4% mm -hmm. in the labor market, meaning that we were finally more than, than half of the working population in the U.S., but it was severely short-lived um, because of millions of jobs lost for women, which you were just well talking about. So, you know, as you think about this through an um, economist lens, as well as through a policy lens, how do we get past that and recover? We already know, um, and, and certainly our audience at AEW knows that women have been out earning associate's degrees to PhDs to medical degrees um, for a long, long time now compared to male colleagues. Yet, you know, we go right in with a wage gap uh, right out of the gate um, into jobs that just compounds over time all the way through to retirement. So how do we think about the fact that women are the majority of degree holders? Uh, women are the majority, exactly as you said, of part-time workers and essential workers in these key industries and sectors that have been hit during the coronavirus. How do we recover and what kind of policies and practices do we need to put into place um, you know, to, for, for the recovery? How do we think about that through an economist lens and maybe a policy lens? Well, I hadn't even brought up yet the fact that this recession is different because um, the kids are at home. <laughs> And um, that makes it, that is probably even a bigger factor in making this a she session than the fact that women work those, um, the, the disproportionate number of jobs in the sectors that were most dramatically impacted. Um, because of the reason why a, a woman chooses to work or not work has often much more to do with what's going on at home than what's going on in terms of the demand for her skills out in the labor market. Mm -hmm. So the fact that um, the kids are at home now and they're not able to return to school in person and they're, they're learning from home, uh, the fact that a lot of daycares are either not reopened or they're open um, only to very um, drastically reduced capacity, means that, I mean, daycare's in shortage, daycare's expensive, it's just going to get more expensive because of the shortage. Um, and, you know, even for women that can afford it, you know, part of my message has been when I looked into a, what's going on with Asian women in particular, and trying to, trying to rationalize what's going on with Asian women who are disproportionately highly educated, but whose unemployment rate has dramatically increased during this pandemic recession, um, it's not always because we got fired. <laughs> it's often because we choose to quit our jobs because there are greater demands, more compelling demands for our time at home with our children than at the job. No matter how much we could get paid at the job, no matter how inexpensive we may, um, you know, how affordable we may be able to find childcare for our own kids. Because, you know, women, mothers are very particular about how their kids should be cared for. Um, you know, it's not that we're gonna jump back to work as soon as we can find daycare that's lower than our wages that we can earn, which unfortunately economists tend to analyze the choice to work or not work because of children and daycare costs. They tend to analyze it as if it's a just a, um, a financial calculation that as soon as you hit wages above daycare costs, well, there you go, that you're off to work. Um, so I think that um, the problem with the challenge for getting the economy back to whatever the new normal will be is made much more severe because of the kids at home right now. And my kids are all grown. They're 20 some year olds, you know, so I don't have this problem now. But when I imagine what I would have done had this happened to me 20 years ago. 
I would have definitely quit my job. Right. So I would have not been able to keep up with a job. And, you know, I would not have been able to pretend that I could keep up with a job, you know, like even if my employer said, oh, no, go ahead and you can work from home, which I'm sure my employer might have said, um, but it would have been impossible. I just know how hard it was to work at home whenever I had to work from home, (laughs) Uh, you know, like, um, so I just know what it's like to have school age kids at home. And it's distracting and nobody can take care of them better than mommy for some reason. So um, it doesn't matter who else is at home, you know? So, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's very challenging to have, um, you know, the children at home right now at the same time that demand for our, um, our work in the marketplace has gone down as well. So it's pulling on both sides of the equation. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, it's interesting, as you say it kind of through what you see with with fellow economists and looking at this almost as if it's a, just a financial decision, or it's like sort of a binary choice. And, and it's really not. And there's so much more than that, as you look at um, whether it's hourly wages or salary too, because it's also productivity levels, like where there's a lot of reports coming out on how Uh, those in the academy are not able to get into their labs to do their research um, because exactly as you said, the mommy side of this compared to the daddy side of this means the kids are running to the mommy still. And that's a societal uh, pressure on on moms to be all and be everything. Actually, let's talk about that for a couple of minutes here because it's um, there's a number of, of areas that we're interested in AEW around policy and practice changes you know, if your hourly wages, fair scheduling so that you've got enough advance notice on scheduling so that you can actually put those um, things in place for child uh, care or elder care, um, you know, how that access to child care is going to be so key. I've been joking, Diane, on a lot of these that if you can imagine getting on the other side of, uh, of this uh, pandemic, how any elected or appointed official cannot believe that every single person in the labor force deserves paid sick leave. I don't even know how you even make the argument that we don't have sort of universal sick leave for those um, within there. But let's spend a little time talking a little bit more on the mothers and fathers, kind of um, what that looks like for women of color, what that looks like um, for people in... um, salary positions versus hourly, because we know there's been a lot of research showing that mothers have absolutely been adversely impacted during the pandemic, um, not just for what's going on in their home, but definitely in their careers as well, saying that they've reduced their work hours four to five times as much as fathers have to care for children. Um, And so, you know, are there some things that we can do to alleviate while we're still in this pandemic? Um, you know, and, and what are some sort of policies and practices? I know we've seen some things from the democratic side of Congress, as well as from the Republican side, but what are you seeing that could be lasting tools out there for the economy and for half of the labor force that are women? Well, I think one thing where that's become clear is that, um, you know, because women are more likely to work these part-time jobs that, um, are, that come without benefits, including paid leave, um, it makes it difficult to, you know, we're not going to be able to, to get women and young people back in the workforce, um, without providing more of those benefits, regardless of, you know, the hours, uh, the number of hours you work a week, and regardless of the kind of employment arrangement you have, you know, in other words, the 1099 workers, the workers who aren't wage and salary workers, right. um, they need to have sick leave benefits. They need to have, um, they need to be able to to um, have health insurance. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of um, costs to, um, you know, if you think about how costly it is for a parent to make the decision to go to work. At a part-time job, when there, um, when there's no compensation for any time that they have to take off to be with their kids, um, it's 
it's just, um, it makes it more likely, you know, the fact that part-time work doesn't come with those benefits yeah. makes it much more likely that women end up being the secondary earner in their family and letting their husband or their partner work the full-time job with benefits. And they just, um, and, and, you know, he supports he covers the family with the, with his own benefits from his full time job, and it's the woman who tends to be the the secondary, the marginal worker that um, will go to work when the kids are back to school and um, stay at home when the kids are at home. I mean, there are a lot of women that um, go to work during the school year, during the school day. In fact, you know, they arrange their hours to be during the school day. And when the kids are home for the summer, they're, they're home. They don't work, you know? So um, I think that policy is going to have to treat, I think there's a recognition that that, that is not fair, that polish, policy toward work should be as generous um, to workers that work part-time as workers that work regular, traditional employment, full-time employment. Um, I also think there's just going to have to be more support for child care and elder care for families, regardless of anyone's work arrangement. Like even if you don't work outside the home, I just think there's going to be um, there. There needs to be more government support of that to to families because it is costly to stay at home and not work as well as to go to work and pay someone else to take care of your kids. Regardless, there's an economic cost that economists have always recognized and paid a lot of attention to. Um, It may not be the driving factor for a lot of women in deciding whether to work or not to work, but it is a factor. And sometimes it's a prohibitive factor because like a single parent has to keep working even if their kids are at home because they're the only breadwinner in the family, Um, you know, or um, uh, a married worker woman has to stay at home because her job, um, her job prospects are low relative to the cost of hiring um, a daycare provider. And she doesn't think the daycare provider is worth even the low cost that she might pay. So. I think there has to be more value placed on caregiving, the caregiving part of our economy, to recognize that none of the rest of our economy could survive if it weren't for caregivers. Yeah. So whether they're, you know, family caregivers or hired caregivers, um, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more investment on the part of government toward the, that caregiving work, whether it occurs at home or whether it occurs as a job. Yeah. There needs to be more value placed on it. The only way that's going to happen to sort of align social private value, the actual pay with the social value is for government to fill the gap. Because right now the private market doesn't think it's worth that much. Right. So um, it's a social value that is undervalued by the private market. And that is a role for government. A, Government comes in when there's a market failure like that, when there's a failure for private value to align with social value. Government comes in and says, no, we're going to subsidize this activity, this line of work, because it is important for our the, the social value of our economy. And by the way, it is important even if all you care about is GDP. Right. Right. And we do need to move away sort of from the Norman Rockwellian view of what we think a family structure is um, and and where we are today in the 21st century to allow people to make choices that are better. And it is about a value on, you know, whether whether you're a, a single human who lives alone or you're in a family structure, what do we value in society and how do we define work? And there's a lot of work inside the home and outside the home and and particularly the work inside the home we've not valued as a society here uh, in, in um, our, you know, in the United States. Um, I want to move a little bit, Diane, before we move into Q and a and start to address some of the things of, of uh, what our audience has, has on their minds um, into a lot of articles. Um, you and I have both been quoted in the media on this too, on 
Most of it has been centered around the class of 2020 and what it means for our children's future. But as we think about, we've been doing a lot with um, millennial and Gen Z programming around how do you even think about professional development? How do you think about networking, mentorship, and sponsorship um, during this unprecedented time? And I, you know, I, I think from my angle, it's not really just a class of 2020. It's almost like a reach back to like, you know, class of 2017 to class of 2022 and or 2023. And you know, I'm living with a seventh grader here, my daughter, and what's going to be the impact? What's the mid range to long range impact on her? So it's pretty bleak right now for anybody trying to enter the job market with the level of competition with uh, large sectors, uh, like we've talked about hotel travel, restaurant service industries being really upended right now. Marriott just announced another huge uh, permanent layoff um, after furloughing for several months as examples. Um, so as we think about this, there's a lot written on it, but what do you think we could expect as we let's, let's kind of, let's pretend we have that magic crystal ball here for a second and that there's a vaccine that can be widely disseminated, call it sometime in 2021. What does 2022 and beyond look like? And what is that, you know, from an economist view, what is that the long tail impact on having a couple years of disruption at these high levels? What does that look like for our nation's young people trying to enter the job market? Um, well, now you're talking about my kids in the ages that they are right now. And you're talking about a lot of um, students that I mentor through my role. Um, I'm on the advisory board at University of Virginia's Public Policy and Leadership School. And, um, you know, I think that um, we are going to see that the demand for um, interpersonal skills, people skills, and um, for experiencing everything that, you know, all the reasons why Leisure Hospitality was doing so well over the past 10 years are um, um, kind of, th that's not going away in the, in the fact that people still want to have um, they want to have human connection, even if that's to be over Zoom. They still want to engage with other people. Um, and I think that the jobs of the future are still going to be jobs that require um, knowing how to organize and work with people and knowing how to facilitate, um, you know, the, the group being larger than the sum of its parts in terms of how effective an organization is. Um, so I, I do think that, um, we should not, the young people shouldn't, uh, feel like, okay, my only job is going to be, uh, working as a tech person for zoom in the future or working for the tech sector, running computer programs. I do think that, um, all the same skills that um, they learn in college in terms of, you know, intellectual development, social development, knowing how to lead groups, to empathize with others, um, to collaborate, to cooperate with each other. All those, all those skills that you hopefully acquire through college as you turn from a kid to an adult, a full-fledged grown-up, um, I think they're still very important. Um, I think that obviously there's going to be some creativity required in the interim, right? For the next year, I've been telling people, you know, try to think of ways you can do your thing, even though you can't meet in person with people. Is there a way you can do the same thing, like offer your same talent, yeah. but um, with the limited limits of technology, the, the limits to the, to the techno te technological sort of interface. Um, I think that I think that the kids will do fine. I, and I think that the economy is moving, will continue to move more toward people like experiences more than things. And they like human interaction more than sitting in front of a computer. Right. Um, I, I, I do believe that. So I don't think people are going to forever just order things on Amazon. I don't believe people are forever just going to get carry out. Um, I think that all those businesses will come back. Um, I think that um, for, I think that in the, in the time that, because young people are having such a hard time getting like real jobs right now, um, I think that the challenges that 
you know, I've been telling a lot of my mentees, you know, you should just go out and volunteer and do stuff for free, even if it's not getting paid, if just do something you really love to do. But that is easier to say to someone who comes from a family that can support. Right, right. So, so I am hoping that there will be businesses and organizations that kind of step up, even if government doesn't step up, which I'm hoping government will step up too, to provide more opportunities um, for young people to work paid internships, um, you know, supported by the company, the organization, the local community. Um, because if, you know, a lot of young people, they do not have the luxury of doing something for free. Um, and it can have, um, you can be critical to, um, be able to work at a job that even if you're not getting paid and even if it's not a real job, that it's something that fits with your vision for your career. It's consistent with your desired career path. So, you know, a lot of young people, though, are forced to wait tables. Well, maybe not right okay. now. That's bad right. Right. But, um, you know, they're forced to, to do just like, I don't know, sales jobs, like online sales or telemarketing or something, um, just because they have to pay bills, right? So that's why all the relief legislation that's being debated is actually really important. It's not just to make people, you know, richer. It's actually to keep them afloat because it's impossible for a lot of people to get paid work right now. That's right. So, you know, or it's not safe or it's not worth it to get the kind of paid work that they can get. Like maybe a young person can go wait tables now in some parts of the country, right? Inside a restaurant, but maybe they don't want to because they have, their health is vulnerable. They don't, they live with a uh, older parent and they don't want to bring home that risk to the, their family. Um, so it has become a situation where we need to have more government support for just like living expenses so that people can just, um, you know, just sit tight for a while longer. They can, they can survive this period before jobs become plentiful and safe again. And I think that that was the shock, most shocking thing for me was early in the pandemic, I was giving interviews and telling people, Oh, it's just like two to four weeks. We just have to sit tight. Uh, it's yeah. just like putting the economy on hold. It's just we're pausing for two to four weeks. And then once it's gone, once the virus has gone away, we can reopen. So no, we're not like telling people they're out of a job for good. We're just telling them, you know, this is not like long-term unemployment, I was saying. This is just literally like a pause. And all those employers are telling their workers not to go anywhere because they want to reopen as soon as they can. And just who would have thought back then that we would not, you know, have gotten this under control enough so that we could safely reopen and, and you know, um, stay reopened in a consistent way. Right. And that's, and that's those dips. Like we're talking about what we went through March to April. And then when we saw the big rise again, in some cases far greater than what we saw in March in some parts of the country, and then right. now starting to try and level out, that's just decimated so many. So, so the actual government support here, exactly as you're saying, to keep people afloat has to go beyond what CARES Act has done thus far. Um, we've had a few questions come up, Diane, around, you know, and, and one would ask you, um, you know, if you're an optimist or a pessimist about change for the future of the labor economy to really make sure women and women of color can be bolstered in the labor mm -hmm. economy um, in meaningful ways. And I want to make sure we can touch on, you know, not just um, the pay gap, um, which is obviously important to us at AUW, but really the total compensation and how we think about benefits uh, flexibility of schedule, et cetera. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm curious if you're an optimist or a pessimist about sustained change here, because certainly, you know, the exacerbation from uh, COVID-19 has really opened our eyes to a lot of these inequities. We know that 70% um, of the of those still working are able to work from home, but that means 30% are essential workers that are on the front lines of our hospitals, um, service providers, et cetera. Um, 
And as I'm thinking about this, you know, I'm really curious. We've been fighting um, to improve the Equal Pay Act uh, for a long time. We've been uh, co-sponsoring uh, and, and co-leading the effort, excuse me, of the Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, that was um, sponsored by both the Democrats and the Republicans on the House side, but hasn't been taken up by the Senate. We don't expect it to in this round. Um, but I'm really curious about how your your thinking is, um, whether or not you believe, because as you said in the very beginning, the COVID-19 and the um, subsequent recession is different than what we saw in 2008, 2009, if we can potentially see real policy and practical change um, in the employment sector and in the labor economy? Um, on the one hand, I'm optimistic because I feel like um, everyone is more aware now of how difficult it can be to be a working parent of young children or of elderly, a young, uh, a working daughter or son of elderly parents. Um, so, I think there's a new appreciation for the work that happens at home that has been largely invisible and not valued by the economy, the, the market economy. Um, I think there's more awareness, there's more appreciation um, from the men of who have had to stay at home for work if they weren't used to that before and have been now around their wives with and seeing how much their wives do with their children at home, even if their wives always had a job outside the home as well. Um, I think there's there's a lot more appreciation for the stresses on working mothers in particular. Um, and so I, I'm optimistic that this has to have an effect on policymaking because, you know, enough of us working moms are kind of screaming about it lately, right? And um, talking about how difficult it is to get back to work. Um, I think that what I'm pessimistic about is um, whether the market economy will ever support pay equity, because it's still it's always going to be true that the market will undervalue um, the care that's given, the work that's done at home, and um, because of that, and also the market will always undervalue the productivity of women in the workplace. If women are given more flexible schedules or, you know, aren't punch, aren't punching the clock as much as um, the men are, there's always this, there's this very narrow view of what economic productivity, what labor productivity means. Um, and, you know, too often are um, the people that run the companies and organizations are too often men and maybe they have a different view of what makes for a productive worker than a woman who has lived through being a working mother might um, appreciate. So I just think that um, the men have an edge. They've, all, they've always had an edge in the market economy. And it is hard for women to to get in those leadership roles as long as the men are still in charge because men like to hire people that remind them of younger versions of themselves. They're just, it's just all of us do actually, all of us do. So if the men are in charge, it just perpetuates um, the difficulty of getting more women up at, at the top. And there aren't enough women, I mean, it's getting better, but there aren't enough women in policy leadership roles in government Either And I think until we get a critical mass of women in key leadership roles in companies, in nonprofit organizations, you know, in government, um, until that happens, um, the market is going to be driven. The market values are still going to be driven by men, yeah. by men's decisions. And um, they're going to not understand what's valuable about one, what women do because they're not women. <laughs> so. and it's interesting that, you know, not all women obviously are like you and I are both moms. Not, not all women in the workplace are moms. There's a lot uh, who are not. So we just, we know that what COVID-19 has exacerbated uh, what it is for child care and elder care right now. I would say, you know, as you were talking through the market and the market value, a lot of this gets to how do we get around um, educational segregation, occupational segregation to really change the conversation so that women can enter into um, yeah. fields, the fields where they're going to excel, but that are also going to be higher paying. Now, I, I will say 
you know, I'm hopeful, Diane, that because of where we are now today, there will be renewed opportunities to uh, revise and pass the Paycheck Fairness Act to increase you know, uh, salary history bans, which we know are working in the municipalities and states where salary history bans have gone in place so that women aren't compounding a lower salary for a long time compared to an equal, you know, male colleague in a role. Um, And then just more transparency in sectors around um, salary um, bans, now not not bans, but B-A-N-D-S's, um, and what the starting salaries and what the promotion rates are um, so that we can move forward. And I'd also, I'd be curious, and I'll, I'll then go back over to some of the questions in our Q&A here, um, because we have, you know, a, a kind of a, a triple opportunity is how I'm going to place this, because we've got the pandemic, which has um, caused us to all open our eyes. We have Uh, the tale of this really scary economy right now and what's going to happen next. Um, And then we have finally a national conversation about racial equity reckoning in this country in a way that uh, you and I have seen, you know, the, the, uh, and participated living here in the uh, district, uh, you know, where we are on Black Lives Matter today, how we are valuing brown and black people in our society, uh, with intense police violence, um, inciting additional citizen violence, uh, how we've heard too much about the China virus and what that's doing for anti-Asian American um, views and all of this extraordinary racial bias really being brought to the forefront um, in, in really scary ways. And there was one question by somebody in the very beginning about as uh, who is a Chinese American woman in the nonprofit arts world and asking about how do you see the job market in particular, you know, for Asian Americans during this time of rising um, violence? But I would add, you know, to that, how do we look at this really for people of color in this? We spent a lot of time talking about, you know, women um, who are also caregivers in the home, but move that aside now. Let's talk a little bit about what, you know, data you're seeing on this around um, varying people of color and particularly getting to, you know, perhaps this, what we hope won't be a moment, but a real movement to move beyond, um, you know, 400 years of racism and structural racism in our country to actually get to this and make sure everybody can participate in the labor economy safely and choosing the paths that they hope for. So, you know, I don't, see the data at an individual level closely enough to understand why I'm seeing um, differences across race and gender groups in the labor market data. But what I can say is that there has been an unusual um, effect of this pandemic recession on, for some reason, Asian women. Right. So I I dug into the Bureau of Labor Statistics data that is available splitting up Asians into women and men. It is not published in their monthly employment reports because it's a smaller sample size than the other race categories. And they don't feel like um, it is as statistically robust as if um, that to allow for, you know, causation and to do, you know, econometric regressions. But I'm just looking at the data, just not trying to attribute any causation. So I can't tell you why, exactly why this is happening. But I can tell you that the data show that Asian women fared the best in the Great Recession in the sense that their unemployment rate did not go up nearly as much as other race, gender categories. Yet this recession, they fared the worst in terms of Um, the change from pre-pandemic to during pandemic unemployment. And the startling statistic for me, and again, I'm going to keep saying I don't know exactly why I have some theories. Um, The startling statistic for me is in August, the Asian female unemployment rate was 11.5% still, Mm -hmm. still in August. The overall unemployment rate had dropped below 10%. Okay, so first of all, Asian females are never below average or or worse than average, I should say. They're never above average in unemployment rate. Secondly, 11.5% is, it's over three percentage points higher than the unemployment rate ever got in the worst part of the Great Recession for Asian women. Over three percentage points. 
the worst it got during the Great Recession was 8.4%, okay, which was far better than any other category except actually white women were the only other category that matched that low point being not so low um, or the highest point of unemployment rate, I should say, being not so high. What I, what I suspect is going on with Asian women is that um, there's a confluence of factors, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Asian women are the most likely women to be in traditional family relationships where they're married to a man. They're married to a man that typically earns even more than they can earn in the market, despite the fact that Asian women are the highest educated um, women by race. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, um, there's a childcare demand factor going on. Not always that it's not their choice. Like I think a lot of these Asian women did not get fired. Actually, my theory, my gut is that most of them quit uh, because most of them are secondary earners. They let their husband keep going to work when they needed to be home for the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though they are actually normally very high earning women outside the home, they were, they are always going to be the secondary earner. They're always going to be the primary caregiver at home. So I think that that traditional, um, the the gendered roles, that factor that's actually affecting all women that are married and uh, have kids. um, I think that that those gendered roles, that factor is magnified when, by just looking at Asian women. So yeah. that's the value of looking at Asian women is because you're not just looking at Asian women. You're looking at a highly educated group of women. You're looking at women who tend to be in these traditional family relationships with kids. You're looking at women who tend to be secondary earners, but primary caregivers. And I think studying Asian women or just looking at them, because BLS didn't publish this in their monthly report, just looking at how their numbers compare to the other groups just tells us something about what is different about this pandemic recession and what different kind of policy it will take to help us recover from it. Because, you know, right now I can say that, you know, you, you know that until the kids are back at school, this is not going to ease up anytime soon, right? right? So uh, for married women with ki- young kids at home. So um, I think that what it tells us is that policymaking going forward has to pay more attention to what's going at home, on at home and not just assume that people's decisions or options to go to work or not go to work just depend on the demand side of the labor market. It depends on the supply side of the labor market too, what's going on at home. And I think an an interesting mental exercise that I've been playing (laughs) or fantasizing about is what if any, everyone in the economy, no matter if you're a man or a woman, young or old, anyone in the economy that cares for any other human being were to just go on strike. (laughs) If women were to say to their husbands, you know what? I am not taking care of the kids today. You take care of the kids today just go out for a day. You know, I just feel like um, there is not enough recognition of how much the whole economy depends on people who aren't even getting paid to take care of other people, right? Or getting paid very little. You know, like what if the 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 people that work in our elder, t- taking care of our elderly parents in assisted living homes, what if they went on strike? Right. All of a sudden, right? Like, so I think to get an appreciation for policy leaders to get a true appreciation for the value of caregiving into the economy, I think we have to at least imagine or fantasize about what would happen if all those, all that caregiving went poof. Yeah. What would happen to the rest of the economy? It couldn't function. Yeah. Right. And we, we can see examples in Scandinavia and, and other parts of the world that are showing real value on, you know, pay um, and on caregiving and on total compensation when we're getting into more benefits, um, which I think will be, you know, a real opportunity as we fast forward into 2021 post this election cycle and seeing what policymakers are thinking about at a municipal, state, and federal level, because, you know, even for me in my role at AUW, I've got about 50 staff, and we looked back at our employee handbook, and we're, you know, throwing out a lot of our policies around telework, around 
uh, dress code around uh, <laughs> yeah. schedules because really, and you know, I'm sitting here in my slippers, Diane. You can't see that <laughs> you know, on the bottom, but that's the reality of our of our world today. And we have to evaluate ways in which those are simple practices. But in addition to the you know the b- broad macro policy making of what we value in society, to have a strong economy that also embraces the diversity of our demography. We know um, the demography of the United States is changing. I mean, just now I saw something a couple weeks ago that shows the total available voters in the United States. And we think of it as, uh, you know, as the baby boomers and Gen X is still being the majority. No, um, you know, half of the potential voting population for the November election are Gen Z and millennial. And so how we think about what we value in our society, how is that changing now through a lens, um, both generationally, but also as our nation's demography um, in education, Education and in the workplace is changing so rapidly. So last question, because I know we got to wrap up here. And um, again, I want to remind everybody who's joined us today, this is being taped um, and you'll be able to refer back to it as well as be able to get links to some of the resources we have on AEW site um, around COVID-19 recovery um, and the areas of policymaking. We hope that our elected and official, uh, elected and appointed officials will take up as well um, to really help women and people of color in, in the workforce. But, um, you know, kind of our, our last sort of um, talk here as we think about this is, you know, beyond policymaking, what can employers and what can individuals do to make sure that as we, we continue in recovery, things get better? And I'll just, you know, lay out some simple ones that I'm thinking of is like reevaluating all of your business practices, uh, really emphasizing your pipeline for uh, diversity, for entry level to senior level, um, and holding people accountable in those ways, regardless of where policymaking is going, because the demography and baby boomers are retiring at a much more rapid rate. But any other thoughts on that, Diane, as we think about the recovery and the road uh, towards a stronger labor economy um, as we move past the pandemic um, around policy versus practices we can all employ or ask of our employers? Um, I think that um, uh, having mentorship programs, I I know a lot of organizations have that. Um, Just getting women more involved and visible in leadership roles um, and uh, figuring out creative ways of getting, bringing young people, new people into your organization, um, sponsoring fellowships, internships, yeah. um, you know, making it possible to kind of broaden the, the, um, your community, your organization's community and the diversity of people that are contributing to your organization's yeah. wisdom. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just, I know that it, it means a lot to people like students tell me it, it, it makes a difference when they take a class from a professor that is an older version of themselves, you know, and, um, a person of color, a, per, a woman, um, you know, in economics, there aren't very many women of color and, um, it's, um, it prevents more women from joining the profession. It also prevents women just the fact that our discipline tends to be th- um, known for its uh, way of putting market values on everything and in a very restrictive way. So I'm trying to kind of push that as well as as encouraging economists to think more broadly about what is valuable to our society, regardless of whether we currently put a price tag on it. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really great point, and that just goes to show that better decisions can be made um, when we have decision makers that look like our demography out there to yeah. really make sure we're making the right decisions for all human beings. Um, Diane, I said that was last question. I lied. I have one oh. more that I think we neglected to get into, and that's um, aging issues. As we think about our aging population here, many of whom have been on fixed incomes and are feeling really uncertain right now about what to do and and how to move forward and. So they're, they're maybe not no longer uh, productive in the labor economy, but are, are retired or uh, and, and living forward. Uh, how should they approach this time and, and look to recovery? There have been you know, some reports on those that are, are looking at um, downsizing their homes. Um, you know, we know what we're seeing in the real estate market. Uh, nationwide and, and thinking about it from the very wealthy to uh, the the lower socioeconomic uh, quartile there. But how do we think about aging 
um, and fixed incomes in this really uncertain time of preparedness? Um, well, I've always thought that the aging population is going to encourage um, more kind of multi-generational family situations. Um, and um, But I might be biased because I'm from an Asian family and we're used to having family live together rather than, you know, in assisted living homes. Um, I think that there is, there are not enough, um, first of all, oldest, older people are the wisest people around. So older people should, should take any opportunity you can to mentor and give advice to younger people, because that is extremely valuable right now. Um, but, um, you know, I think in terms of once you, we, the, the true aging, the health problems with aging um, and the need for caregiving as we grow old, um, that is a serious problem that um, touches upon even immigration policy, to be honest. Like, I, I just think that we are not going to be able to, as Americans, provide enough care to our elderly population as the baby boomers continue to, to age and need care. Um, unfortunately, I don't think all of my children are going to want to take care of me when I get old, but um, maybe they will. I had four of them, so maybe at least one out of four will, will do. It's called my diversified portfolio. But um, I think that I think that um, I think that a lot of American families um, they are not in the practice of taking care of elderly parents, or they just don't think they're very good at it, right? And um, um, I've been frustrated with immigration policy and think that there is a need to look very systematically at not just caregiving needs at our for our children, but caregiving needs for our elderly population. And then combined, you know, um, thinking about um, how immigration policy should actually be helpful in that regard. Like if we don't have enough people, enough Americans who want to go into caregiving work, let's let's, um, you know, uh, let more skilled immigrants come into this country. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a toughie. And I think, you know, one, um, we're advocating for more assistance, obviously, um, from the federal government and state governments to make sure that everybody exactly, as you said earlier on, that we can um, keep afloat during what none of us anticipated when we, the world shut down at, in the middle of March, that we'd be still sitting in our slippers at home on Zoom um, and luckily safely doing that. But so many are in danger of losing their homes, um, you know, are, are not getting forgiveness on rent or mortgages um, or have healthcare needs, exactly as you're saying, or just yeah. don't even have the, the money um, available to them to, to make their monthly um, uh, needs. And so I, I could say, because I know we're running out of time, this could be probably a three-part series, Diane, we could do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to, to keep talking about the various, because there's so many different strands and we didn't even have time to really dive into um, a few of the industries that maybe are excelling right now versus those that are, are really um, being hit so hard. Um, but I just simply want to say thank you for sharing your honest candor, um, for your deep dive into the data and understanding what it's like uh, to be a woman and an Asian American woman in a sector that is really dominated by men and bringing all of your personal experiences and professional experiences to bear on this topic because we're in such uncertain times. I know it's said a lot, um, but being able to get perspective and see through how we can improve our society so that all can thrive is really where we are at AUW, that we really want to ensure that all can thrive. Um, and we want to see the policies and practices in place that can allow that to be. So I thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This was a great talk. Yeah, it's really been enjoyable. And my best to you and Bill, and I hope <laughs> to see you again very soon. Thanks, Kim.